As one enters Boku, a town in the Upper East region of Ghana, one is flanked by tree-lined streets, banks, traders, guinea fowl sellers, motorbikes whizzing back and forth, and donkey-drawn carts carrying wares of all kinds. It could be any other town, except that every other minute, a blue police minivan or a green camouflage pickup with soldiers toting guns passes by, and one is reminded that Boku is a town in conflict. In this program, I find out about how peace is being restored in Boku. Aisha Harunata reporting. Suhmasim Villa, Yachakaturi Suhmasim, the Bidibsi, the Tunzopaba, the Badma, not the Madame Bambia, Boku Sulinsini, Yachakati Chazaba, Kasu Dua Chana, Yachakati Bangi, no Zaba, Nyala Kansana, Zaba, Nyala Bunsha, Kantahri Birimna, Zaba Chakatu Kongala. Peace jingles first in Kusal language and then in Mampuli, created as one of the ways to preach a message of peace in Boku. The conflict in Boku is mainly between the Kusasi and Mampusi ethnic groups. Malvi Dr. A. Wahab Adam, Amir or head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission in Ghana and a member of the National Peace Council, details the relationship between them. You know, there are certain ethnic groups in the, in, the, in the country uh, which would want to seek the support of other ethnic groups because of the strength of the kingdom that uh, they are seeking protection from. So it so happened that the Kusasis had uh, from a, a narration sought this type of protection from the Nampusi and uh, the Mampusis have then nominated uh, their representatives to be chiefs in that locality. And uh, this had continued for some time. But then a time came when they felt that they have come of age and they want to be chiefs themselves. In 1957, Ghana gained independence from the British. What happened next in Boku's history? Mr. Shaibu Abubakar, the program manager of Buda, the Boku East Women's Development Association, a local NGO in Boku, narrates. In terms of disagreement as conflict, uh, started around the 1950s, uh, probably 57, when there was an agitation by one ethnic group, you know, to claim independence, and so there was that agitation, and the government of the CPP had to step in and the matter was referred to a commission of inquiry to look into the matter. The commission came out with a report submitted to government and then there was also an appeal against the findings or recommendations by the other ethnic group. So the appeal went through the court system and the high court that picked up the appeal listened or upheld the appeal. And based on that, the matter was then referred to the then West African Court of Appeal that upheld the recommendations or the findings, if you like, of the commission. So, and that was around 1958. So when that happened, then the government of the day enskinned the first Kusasi chief for the traditional area. That was on until 1966, when the first coup d'etat experience, experienced in this country removed the then chief and reversed the order to the old arrangement, meaning that the Mampusi took over at that time. In May then about of 1981, the chief at that time Happened to, who happened to be a man person, died. But the funeral rites were not performed. 
Then came 31st December 1981, and of course, the food dragging or whatever continued. That went on until 1983, when we had some violent conflict, again related to the same chieftaincy matter. So the government of the PNDC at that time set up a commission, and the PNDC then uh, revisited the issue based on what Nkrumah did in 1958, and then passed a PNDC law that then said the rightful occupant will be the Kusasis, and then the son of the chief who was skinned earlier was skinned as Bokunaba, and he has since been the chief of Boku. 1984, we had the same conflict erupting, and it was uh, coming from the fact that the enskinment, you know, definitely will not be appealing to many others. So there was some kind of conflict. It also followed up in 1985. Now what the government of the PNDC did at that time was to pick key people the government thought were fanning the problem, send them elsewhere, and they were kept for some time. After length of time, I think about six months, if not more, then they were released. And from 85, we didn't experience any conflict until December 2000. Mr. Shaibu Abubakar telling the history of the Boku conflict. In December 2000, Ghana went through national elections. There was a delay in the release of the results, and soon Kusasis and Mampusis were embroiled in fighting that left over 50 people dead, 2,000 displaced, and several wounded. Mrs. Janet Mohammed, the director of the West Africa Human Rights and Democratization Project with IBIS, a development NGO, was then with the Christian Council of Ghana. She describes her work. As the director of the Christian Council, we had to respond. Um, the hospital, the, the Presbyterian hospital, needed some kind of medicaments and food to feed the sick people. Also, people were entering the hospital and attacking um, wounded persons on the bed. So we had to do something immediately. So immediately I mobilized food um, uh, materials, so that's rice, millet, I mean, sugar, milk, tea, everything. And also mobilized medicaments, which um, I took. There was a truck that carried the food and I drove myself and, and journeyed through the uh, Gambaga scarf into, uh, through Garu into Boko where we presented the items. And that was the first gesture of our intervention. Mrs. Mohammed then met with Buda, Ibis, Action Aid, the West Africa Network for Peace, WANEP, Catholic Relief Services, World Vision, and the District Assembly. Together, they drew up a strategic intervention plan for Boku. After conflicts broke out again in 2001, these stakeholders brought together both factions as well as members of the other minority ethnic groups in Boku to get them talking for the first time. In Damango, we put them in the same guest house facility. It was conducted at the Catholic Unity Center. I think at the initial stages there was fear, the fear of the other. In fact, they took the rooms in corridors according to their different groups. And um, everybody was kind of suspicious of the other. There was a lot of tension and some kind of disquiet. The following day was when we started this program. Everyone was looking out for who are who the hell are these people who have brought us together. So in the facilitation team, we had three people. We had Emmanuel Bombande, we had myself, Janet Adama Mohammed, and then we had Adama Zoya from CRS. Then we as facilitators decided to look at how do we introduce the session? Because it was a challenging issue for us. So we decided to look at causes of conflict, effects of conflicts. Then we looked at their vision for Boko. Then there was a halt in the process because they asked, who are you people? I went to the back. I was so challenged. I was so, my spirit was so dampened. And I found a corner to shed my tears. And then I had some sobbing at the back and I looked around it was Emmanuel and he was also he held me as a sister and so we sobbed to the best then we said what do we do and then we said we are not lawyers 
we don't belong to any court of justice in this country. We don't come from the police, BNI, or anything. We don't belong to any political party. And that we were just working with the district assembly to find a solution to this long-standing conflict. We are just here to create the space for them as factions to engage. So we put them in groups after the second day, and we said, go into the groups, look at the causes of conflict, and tell us what is actually causing the conflict. And so we looked at them and said, now that you have listed all this, go back and look at how we can respond to this. Each group came back with a list, and we said, okay, now select your representatives, and let's come out with a common response. And we came out with the 15-point communique, which is commonly called the Damango Peace Communique, on Boko de Boko Peace Communique. After the signing of the Damango Peace Initiative, relative calm seemed to return to Boku until December 2007. The Kusasis were observing the Samanpid, a festival that heralds a good harvest when violence erupted again. Alaji Sabiru Zabrim, the Upper East Regional Correspondent of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, was present at the festival. During the festival, everything looked normal. The whole Boko Township was uh, under siege. In fact, a lot of uh, security personnel were deployed. So we didn't, we didn't even have uh, any this impression that the, 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 the conflict would break out. But before we could re realize, we saw people running uh, at the festival ground. People were running, leaving the festival ground, running you know, to go back home. Then when we inquired, they said, oh, they have started killing people in the remote areas. And news has reached them that some of their relatives have been killed. So people started running away from the uh, festival ground. By then, we, we, could, we didn't know what to do. So after the festival, we went to the uh, divisional police commander in Boku to inquire what was happening. But he told us that it was armed robbery keys. It's not a, a conflict thing. It was, uh, some, some, some people were attempted to steal and they shot and killed them. But subsequent reports we had was that it wasn't an armed robbery case. It was rather the Kusasi and uh, Mapurisi conflict which has broken out. The conflict escalated for the first few weeks of the new year. 2008 was also an election year in Ghana. Given the volatile nature of Boku, many in the country expected it to blow up. Mrs. Afi Yakubu is the Associate Director of the Foundation for Security and Development, FOSTA, an NGO dedicated to understanding security and peace-building issues. She describes how her organization joined the fight to prevent the elections in Boku from degenerating into violence. There was um, a large deployment of youth and women, you know, and we also utilized the media a lot. And so contrary to popular opinion that uh, Boku was going to erupt in 2008 elections, it did not. And so we thought that our intervention and activities uh, had a role to play in that. You know, unfortunately, you know, it's come up again, so maybe what we did uh, should have continued, which we, we didn't follow through. For technical reasons, you know, you have this uh, one of budgets, four projects, and uh, so it was just cosmetic dressing that the situation in Boko requires more than just one of activity. It requires a sustained campaign and, you know, research to understand the cultural dynamics that continue to uh, fuel the conflict. One of the women who, for security reasons, we'll call Mrs. Talata Ibrahim, took part in the demonstration described by Mrs. Yakubu. She's a member of the Concerned Women of Boku, an organization started in 2007. Concerned women had planned an earlier demonstration before the elections, which Mrs. Ibrahim said helped ease tension in the area. It came to a point where we could not sit down and watch, and that was after the slaughtering of the women and children. Then 
at that point, we felt it was not getting out of hands and we had to act. So a few women made up of the different tribal settings in Boko came together. What was the action we had to take? We said, fine, at least we can have a peaceful demonstration to tell our men that we are not happy with whatever that is happening in Boko because what is the future of the town? What is the future of the children? Then we scheduled a day and the women came out and uh, in fact, the children were even more than the women, and they were so happy. Whilst we were shouting, we wanted peace in Boko, the children were shouting, we want education. We want to be free. We want to visit our friends, and all those things, slogans. So we went around the township. Then immediately after that, I think the town opened up. Why do I say so? Before that, you could not get a Kusasi man move through the stronghold of the Makoshi settlement and the vice versa. But when we did that, two days after, they started movement. After the 2008 elections, the government changed hands as a new patriotic party lost to the National Democratic Congress. Relative peace was experienced in Boku until the last days of May 2009. Some people who had been incarcerated for having burnt a pregnant woman, were released. Their family members in the Boku Township were said to have been celebrating, and this led to retaliation by the deceased woman's family. At the end of the skirmish, three people were dead. Many in Boku were disappointed. For the first two days, you would think that I was crying morning and evening because I was always asking myself, why? Why again? Why again? And what is the fate of the town? And will it continue or there will ever be a stop? And, and why should we continue to suffer this way? And why should it be Boko? I, I kept asking myself, if at the first night, I must confess, I came down from my bed, I sat down, and when, you know, you cannot cheat nature, when I opened my eyes, I saw myself lying on the floor. And my eyes were so, in fact, you couldn't look at me. Even as I'm talking, I feel like weeping. Mrs. Talata Ibrahim describing the emotions that tore through her when she heard Boku was in arms again. The new government has been in power for about six months. A day before fighting broke out at the end of May, the president of Ghana, Professor John Evans Atamels, visited Boku, Naba Asigri Abugrago Azuka III, the Boku chief and leader of the Kusasi, and Alaji Akalifa, representative of the Mampusi, shook hands and presented their case to the president. The eruption of violence won't deter the government, says the Upper East Regional Minister, Honorable Mark Boyongo. What I can say is that we, as a government, are committed to finding a solution to this problem before the end of our four-year term, our first four-year term, where the president is committed to finding a solution to the problem within the next three, four years. Like the president said when he came here, he invited the uh, Mamprusis, he invited the Kusasis. Um, the Kusasis told the president their version. The Mamprusis also told him their version, and they said they had documents to support their case. Now the president says, we as a government will not interfere in the chieftaincy institution but we will respect, you know, the decisions of those institutions which can determine chieftaincy issues. So, for example, House of Chiefs, for example, the Supreme Court, the courts. So, if uh, they travel that distance and there's a, a ruling by those institutions, as a responsible government, we are duty-bound to enforce the decisions of those institutions. At a meeting of the Inter-Ethnic Peace Committee, comprised of six Kusasis and six Mampusi members, a secretary and three facilitating NGOs, Buda, Action Aid, and Ibis, here are some of the chairman's remarks. Once again, we are coming here to work toward the peace of Boko, peace for the citizens or residents of Boko and its environment. I think it's a privilege and a duty 
bestowed on us as members of the Boko Interethnic Peace Committee to work for peace. This is the direct method. Government have appointed our members to work for uh, the peace of the area. We will have to devise ways because it is our area we know what needs to be done to enable us to achieve permanent peace in We were inaugurated on 5th May this year and we all agreed to serve on the commission. We were selected by our respective communities to represent them in work for peace. We agree, and so far we have exhibited a willingness, a readiness to work for peace. Today's assignment is simple and straightforward. And first of all, we will review what we did, our delegation did. The delegation was sent to make a radio program for the Canada. Then we will plan tomorrow's radio program. We have a second program, program. Laws have been passed, peace initiatives have been signed, and yet Boku is still volatile. What is different about the Inter-Ethnic Committee? Mr. Mohamed Nambe, the youngest member of the committee, responds. Yeah, the difference is that the Boku Peace Initiative was owned by NGOs. NGOs, they would just call you to a meeting, give you directives, do this, do that. But the Boku Inter-Ethnic Peace Committee is owned by the, the, the protagonists, so to speak, the Kusaris and the Mampuses. And their leadership, they are the people who, who are representing their people. I mean, the leadership of the Mampuses are there, and the leadership of the Kusaris are there. And they are bringing out these, they are brainstorming, bringing out the ideas themselves. If we do this, it can help. If we do that, it can help. But it used not to be like that. Boku Peace Initiative would just bring a long tail of uh, you know activities say, let's do this and that so people didn't own it so that the commitment was not there but once people own up to this initial uh, this committee they think it's, it, it, it must work and i can see one thing as a member of the committee too i can see some commitment and it's like the membership that are there are really committed and dedicated to working towards getting lasting peace mrs janet mohammed says it needs to be recognized in fact, if they say that the Boko Peace Initiative was done by outsiders and they didn't own it, I would say I would say that it's true and yet it has given birth to what they call the Peace Committee now. You know, it's all part of the politics of play between uh, government initiatives and civil society initiatives. Because after we had done all the consultations, um, the, the recommendation we gave was for them to set up a peace committee so they can own it and they can set the parameters of operation themselves. So first of all, I would say that the peace committee, if they have to move forward, they should acknowledge the Boku Peace Initiative and its efforts. Many of the actors in the Boku Peace process say there's a lack of communication between groups. Boku citizens say the security forces are not thorough with the investigations. The National Peace Council was not informed of the Inter-Ethnic Peace Committee's formation. The different committees say they don't receive enough funding or recognition. The police forces say they don't have adequate housing, equipment, or food. These seem to all hinder the peace-building process. Yet, across board, one message that comes out strong in Boku is the devil finds work for idle hands. Youth unemployment needs to be tackled. As a member of the National Peace Council, Mulvi Wahab Adam recalls how the council organized a program that took Boku youth to Accra, the capital city of Ghana. What we have done, and we did this before the elections, was to bring the students of all the ethnic groups in Boku and uh, camp them at the University of Ghana for two weeks, sensitizing them about the fact that they are one people, sensitizing them about the fact that the nation, not only for the present, but also posterity, will not forgive us if we disturb the peace. And uh, to reason with them that uh, what actually uh, should make us kill, maim, and uh, destroy. There is no benefit. So we did this to a degree that we made them 
ambassadors for peace, all of them. So they went back to Boko and preached peace to their parents, to their teachers, among themselves, and to the various communities. And I believe that that also was very, very helpful in uh, bringing about the type of result or being the peace that we had or which prevailed during the time of the elections. Another issue that comes up is that the conflict has morphed into one of revenge. Mr. Abdullahi Abanga is a former municipal chief executive of Boku. He talks about how he tried to eliminate this hatred during his term in office. I made sure that all those who lost their families from January 2008 or 31st December 2007, I identified them. So I had a personal relationship with the relatives of those who died. I got people, I cancelled some of them, I cancelled some of them myself. I tried to set them up to do some, some economic activity so that they could, they could be busy. In fact, some of them had planned to die. And that was when I actually cared to me that I needed to do something to them. I needed to work on them to forget. Even though some are convinced there'll be no peace in Boku, many are hopeful. Here are some of the solutions for Mrs. Afi Yakubu and Mr. Mohamed Nambe. I think that one solution is to depoliticize the conflict in Boku. If we are able to depoliticize the conflict, that is by saying that irrespective of which political party you belong to, if you go against the law of the land, you are going to be dealt with according to the constitution. And then the policy, the government follows through on this. The message will be very clear and direct. Because um, whether we like it or not, we've gotten to a stage in the conflict in Boku where there is that perception that if the government that is in favor of my cause is in power, I can do what I want, and it promotes impunity. But our constitution cannot condone impunity, it does not condone impunity. Everybody must be equal before the law, irrespective of your political affiliation. The chieftaincy should needs to be readdressed. Okay, that's the bottom the next one. Secondly, employment. The youth need to be employed. And thirdly, they must, to me, there should be a lot of sensitization, a lot of sensitization or education of the youth, so that the mentality they've had for some time needs to, you know, be eliminated. And fourthly, I would ask of uh, what the exercise that they are doing now. I think we need to get the, the, the I mean, what we need to retrieve the arms of the people by what means that we, the government needs to invest so much on that. Very important. As a last word, this is what peace means to the people of Boku. Uh, I'm Belko David Molly, co-chair of the Boku Interethnic Peace Committee and representing the Mampuse group. Certainly peace is something we cannot gamble with. Some of us have enjoyed the peace and tranquility of the area for over 60 years. We have seen the benefits of peaceful coexistence in the area. We have intermarried and we have done a lot of things together irrespective of the tribal differences. So we are doing everything possible at our disposal to make sure that the peace we enjoyed some time ago is regained. I am Grace Nko, a member of the Inter-Ethnic Committee and I represent the Kusasi group. Uh, peace is really dear to our hearts and we have suffered so much in this conflict. We have realized that most of our professionals have left. Uh, people are not accepting postings to the area and it's a worry. Production generally has reduced and everybody is not secure. We really want to work seriously, target some groups and make sure that we regain the past glory that we used to have. Aisha Haruna Atta reporting from Accra.